Not to say I don't value you. I'm also giving this presentation somewhere else in 25 minutes, so one of your inputs can be to tell me what I can cut out of this because it's, <laughs> it's running a little long. I just told Robert it's better to have never done it at all because it's so much easier than deleting your own stuff, you know. It, it, it all looks so critical to me. Trying to put it in 25 minutes and cut it out already. <laughs> all right, so we're going to talk about birds today. My favorite bird is the sage hen. I haven't seen any sage hen since yesterday morning, so you can believe that's true. And uh, Nate, what's your favorite? Uh, Northern Harrier, which is a hawk. I haven't seen one since yesterday either. There you go. There you go. So Nate is an ornithologist. He's the guy that collected all the data for this, but not only that, he put it into four spreadsheets and then we even did some more and you're going to see there's over 15,000 birds so there's a lot of work. I certainly appreciate his help with that. And also Montana, renowned expert on damselflies and dragonflies, a very well-rounded guy. Anytime I have a picture of an insect I send it to Nate and he tells me what it is. And he believes. And I believe him. Robert, your favorite bird. Yes. Huh? Yes, it is. Okay, he's going to vote with that one too. All right. Birds also taught us flight, and uh, of course they do it so much more eloquently than we do. So, recovery process. If there's two words that captures my attention, it's going to be recovery process. And this topic is the bird use in a restored riparian corridor in southwest Montana, and that means Silver Bowl Creek right down here. But this is one aspect of the recovery process. I'm going to give you one slide to summarize 15 years of work. Silver Bowl Creek, we removed 6 million cubic yards of mine waste, relocate the stream, cover soil to grade, and revegetate it over a decade and a half. This is an a air photo from, what was it, 98, 1998. So there's Silver Bowl Creek coming along the south edge of the floodplain, and then it kind of arcs up to meet Brown Sculch Creek here. This is probably the worst contamination. So this started with Butte mine waste, tremendous flood around the, the turn of the 20th century, washes down, and here it's up to a meter deep. This is the biggest barren area. It's not all like that. It's not like that even right here. What else can we see here? How about, uh, nobody here will remember this but me, those are some of the original stars plots. At one time, that would have been the topic. That would have been what we'd all be talking about. So there are some of the star plots in there. And where it's white, that's extra salty. So there's always going to be salts on the surface, but those places you see are white like that. Now I'm going to zoom down on the ground right here. So this is Browns Gulch Creek comes in and it had, comes through here in a box culvert, made a little arc around there. And that's what it looks like. So we're looking north up the creek, out to the right here. Butte's up there. The mine waste is flowing downstream, coming this way. Browns Gulch Creek is flooding at the same time. And so it reentrains the sediments instead of settling out and washes out and leaves this clean. Okay? Anybody believe that? <coughs> if that was clean, how come there's no plants on the margin of the stream? How come there's sclerosis in the sedges there? And how come these willows are stunted and these willows are big up here? So to the practiced eye, there's still contamination there, but it's certainly not meter meter thick stuff like that and that's what it looks like today so that's the revegetation there's the box culvert the creeks coming through we moved it you know we took out that curve that was over there but just to give you an idea what the project looked like this is a google project uh, uh, photo it doesn't have the resolution of that air photo but it shows something and we still see the creek coming along the south edge it's 2002 it doesn't show up good because we don't know these are blue, and that's copper salts. So this showed something just because of the time of the year that the other one didn't show, and I remember that. This is what it looked like in places when I started working on it. Those are the blue copper salts there. And now we're going to look at Google Earth 2014, so it's been remediated. So let's refresh your memory. The, the creek came along the south edge and then arced up like this to meet Brown Sculch. This is what I would call an engineer's idea of sinuosity. <laughs> now, I float a lot of rivers, I haven't floated one just like that. But uh, they like those cookie cutters, those engineers. I like to make fun of them too. 
So uh, also, what else do I see? Well, there's a pond here, a pond here, a series of ponds up here. There's even a pond on the north side in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now I'm going to zoom back down to the ground like I did the last time. And we're going to zoom down right here, looking up the floodplain. And we're going to zoom right here, looking at a little island on that pond. That's the biggest pond. And then we're going to look at the outlet of the pond that flows to Silver Bowl Creek there. So there it is, looking up the stream. I think everybody that worked on the project can be justifiably proud of the job that we did. And this is the pond, this we call Gull Island. Now Nate just told me he stopped there yesterday. Station 29, as he calls it, I have to say what? About two hours ago I was there. Two hours he's there, and what, 330? 330 gulls. But mostly California gulls this time. So they love this uh, habitat. They're not waterfowl, but they're certainly can be associated with water. And here we are at the outlet of the pond. <clears throat> this has two types of vegetation that are going to come up later in the talk. One of them is emergent vegetation. That means that it's rooted below the water surface, but it's rooted in dirt and it grows up above it. So this is Scorpus microcarpus here and this is Iliacris plusters. I see a prairie cord grass over here. I'm sure you all know those names, so we'll translate them for you. And the other type is I call it fluvial tall sh shrubs. So in this case, it happens to be mostly buffalo berry, but there's a willow there and some willows there. So those are two types that we're going to meet later. This is Nate's procedure here. We start at dawn. Oh, they say wait for the pre-dawn course to, to quiet out. And <clears throat> we sample one sub area per run. Five measured minutes. He has a stopwatch. He did it for four months. And so we capture the migratory birds and the summer residents. Records birds by sight and sound, and the whole session takes four hours. Now, in a perfect world, we'd like it to take five minutes because we'd like to sample it all at exactly the same time because time is a variable on where birds are at different time of the day. But I think you generally got done maybe more than three, or take four. What's that? Did it take three hours or four hours? About four. It takes about four hours to do it, okay. So 20 stations in four. Now if I said to you, the early bird gets the worm. The early bird gets the worm. You're smiling, girly. What bird are you thinking of? What, oh, you, I know you're thinking of a bird. <laughs> Come on, what bird are you thinking of when I say the early bird gets the worm? This is supposed to be easy. Huh, the robin. Okay, so we use abbreviations, Nate used abbreviations. The robins, that, oops, not that. The, the, it's the AMRO, so it's the American robin. Okay, now I'm going to have you guys guess these for me. The CLSW is the. It's just fun, guys. Just shout it out. <laughs> two letters from the first and two letters from the second. Cliff Swallow. Good for you, Cliff Swallow. Now I hope everybody can get this. Okay, I'm not even going to make you answer that one. Okay. The RBGU ring-billed gull. So this is a ring-billed gull. And the Kago. Kago is easy. The Canada Goose. All right. If you just counted the observations of those four species and summed it up, that's 39% of all observations are these four species. So if we're out on the floodplain and you're the gambling type and you're going to bet on what's the next bird you see, you're going to pick one of these four because that accounts for a lot of the observations of birds there. Okay, for a cliff swallow, you're going to have structure. So this is a bridge on Silver Bowl Creek over by Fairmont. You need insects. These are mayflies. Probably not, but I'm calling them mayflies. And they can tell me what they really are. Not that good of a photo. That's on Silver Bowl Creek. Put them together, you get cliff swallows. I don't think we have to go around, but we're going to the second species and the fourth species are both waterfowl, and the third species is kind of in between. And there's the ring billed gulls uh, in the water next to Kyle Island there. California in there, too. And California, too. Paul, can you guess from that crummy slide, what's that plant in the water there? What's it's the plant? Cottonwood or willow uh, seeds. How about ranunculus aquatilis, maybe? On the surface, yeah. Okay. I think so. <laughs> All right. And the Canada goose. Canada goose, 
places a premium on security. They like to be places out on the ice, out on gravel. Much less common to see them in a place like this. This is Silver Bow Creek too, up in Reach A, close here. I'm going to get a picture of that on this trip. Um, Joe, what does that look like now? Whiskey Gulch looking upstream. What's it look like now? Look, uh, Just like this. There's no willows, right? The, the beavers have eaten almost all the willows, so, the, so that's reverted to... So the, the, the beavers are now out of there. They've been out of there. But the willows are still gone, though. No, I think the willows are pretty dense in there still. Well, I'll, I'll have a picture next time. It looks pretty bleak to me compared to this. I now... Grass growing there. Yes. You can't keep it out of any picture, but we're, but we're not talking about grasses today. Now I'm going to give you some hard ones. We gave you the easy ones to warm up on. What's the whiffle? Anybody can guess what the whiffle is? It's, it's the willow flycatcher, okay? And the mower, these are harder ones, but we're going to use them later. The mower is the marsh wren. And this one isn't quite as hard, the SPSA. And that's the, the spotted sandpiper. Okay? All right. So, <clears throat> bird habitat use varies. Uh, they're mobile and they vote with their wings where they want to be. And so, where they are, there's going to be an element of chance in any given moment. You could have good habitat, it could have a lot of birds. Nature stops by today, there's 330. I don't think we ever counted 330 at that station. There you go, it just happened. All right, so this is going to be important when we're doing uh, uh, mathematical analysis it is <clears throat> and they they can move around to meet their habitat preferences I didn't say needs I think a lot of times it's preferences and of course we have the basic components of habitat food and water cover and then special habitats like uh, that sage hen at the beginning was of course on a lek on a display ground nest sometimes we forget about nesting rookeries and so on so one of the important groups <clears throat> what we call the passerines, passerines, in the order passeriformes, and that would form as, and that would be uh, between the class and the family is the order. So there are songbirds that are perching songbirds, so that's a pretty big one. So obviously for birds like this, we're going to have to have perching site. Now I didn't know Nate was going to come today and, and tell me about the, the gulls, but that's the Bohemian waxwing. Observed once on Silver Bolt Creek by Nate. Once. They were a winter visitor. Winter visitor, they were there once. And there was 120 birds the once. Okay. They're one minute gone the next. They're one minute gone. So I'm introducing you this idea when we start looking at the numbers. There's a lot of chance things happen. You're there, you're not. You're at the right time. Only one time were they there, but they weren't. That, that's a big number to us. They maybe you saw 250 in the sub area that day, and 120 birds were just in one spot. And these are the parameters we're going to talk about. <clears throat> we're going to talk bird counts. I have to tell you a quick anecdote on counts. So a buddy of mine was, was uh, defending for his doctoral degree, and, and one of the professors asked him, what's the basis of statistics? And I think all of you know what the answer was supposed to be. What's the basis of statistics? And he says, counting. All right, counting. Measuring? I don't think you're going to go very far in statistics without counting and measuring. So we're going to do counts. Or density. Well, density is better than counts because, because you can handle unequal sample sizes. So we can do birds per station, for example, if we have 10 or 20 samples. But if we do counts, it has to be even number uh, of observations that goes into it. Species richness, species density. I'll explain these in just a minute. Equitability or evenness. And then we looked at trophic classes and end up talking about habitats. So the species is the fundamental unit of taxonomy. It's the fundamental unit of inventory. And it is not the fundamental unit of diversity, or it shouldn't be. So what would you like a fundamental unit of diversity? What would be the attribute you would look for? Well, we want to have classes that are equally different and equally important. And species aren't. Clearly, they're not, right? So everybody gets sucked into it. A French ecologist called it the species vortex. We all get swept into this. But I want you to be aware of the limitations, even though we use them. If you read a whole book on, species, on diversity, trust me, it's going to be 90% species diversity, no matter they're going to agree with me. But it's going to end up right back at species. So 
Robert and I are friends. I'm going to put him on the hook. I like to embarrass people. There's a quote I got out of a book, Robert. Tell me if you agree with it or don't agree with it. Yeah. I put you didn't get a chance to consider it. I'm just in, just doing my best to embarrass you. Maybe not. That's right. I would say maybe not. Because species richness doesn't have any relative abundance at all. Okay? And everybody uses species richness. So I'm going to explain this to you. You get this free for the price of coming today. So here's, we're going to put this on a scale that goes around. Here's species richness. All it is is a count of the species. There's no relative abundance whatsoever. What's the, spe what's the species richness in this room? Uh, no, there's no mutants here, there's no aliens. It's one. Okay, wait a minute. 100 species of bacteria on your skin, another 1,000 in your gut. Clearly all species aren't equal and we're not thinking about that, are we? But it's one, okay? Now, let's suppose we had 100 people here, just to make it easy on me. Four people out, walk out. In comes a snake, a dog, a pig, and a Neanderthal. Okay, now what's, this, what's the species richness? Five. Does anybody think that there's five times more diverse than it just was? We still have 96 humans. Okay, so that introduces the idea of relative abundance. And when we say relative abundance, that means we're going to take numbers and make them into percentages. That's the relative part of that. So now we're coming up on our scale to the Shannon Index, equitability. We use that in this, so we have to know a little bit something about it. And that still has a, a species richness. It, the count is still important. But now it also puts weight on the relative abundance. And it, <clears throat> what it is looking for is relative evenness or equitability. So let's go back. 100 people in the room, one species, the Shannon value is zero, okay? Because there is no equitability. It's all just one species. Now, in comes the snake, whatever I told you, the dog, the pig, and the Neanderthal. Oh, I wanted, why is the Neanderthal in there? Well, even back in species richness, we have two hominids, one reptile, and two other mammals, right? So we can see all the problems that are coming into this with the species. Okay, back on this. Now, <clears throat> that's going to have a number for 96, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, but it's going to be pretty small, but it's still going to be bigger than zero. So how could we get that higher? Well, <clears throat> if there was 20 humans, 20 pigs, 20 snakes, 20 whatever Neanderthals, that would maximize. It couldn't get any higher now until we added a six species. And it would have to be 17% or whatever. Okay, now we're gonna swing over to the other side. The Shannon Index, dominance, concentration, whatever you wanna call it. That still has species richness, but it's pretty low now. And it's putting all the weight the other way on the most abundant ones. So if we had all the same, 100 of us the same, that would be one. 1, 100, however you want to look. That would be unity. That would be as high as it could go. And it would be a real high number if it was 96, 1, 1, 1. Okay? And then last, Berger and Parker. That's just the highest number. So that's also going to, in this case, be 1, or it's going to be 96, whereas the Shannon would have been 0.96 squared, so it'd be somewhat lower than that. All right. So now we're all set on diversity. So this is something, this is vegetation data I collected in the late 70s. And these have two dozen plant communities in order of increasing richness. And those lines there, don't worry about them, they're standard deviations. So increasing richness, okay? And this is the Shannon Index, okay? So I see three communities here that are all about the same even though the richness went up. And then it starts going up and then you would have a place where you'd have pretty good richness. I guess it would be this one. And you'd have, well, well, that means that you just had one dominant species, even though maybe you had 20 species that you sampled, but just one, like that, okay? And here's what's kind of interesting, because there's a lot of argument, you know, I like this, the sh Shannon, what's wrong with the Shannon? And uh, why would you, well, you like equitability? This is Shannon. And it looks just like a mirror image of the equitability, doesn't it? So when this one's high, this one's low. And then this one's low, this one's high. So really, they're complementary ways. One puts the, the, the uh, emphasis on evenness, the other one puts it on um, the most abundant ones, but they, you subtract them all from one. It's, it's really kind of the same thing. All right, now we know something about that. 
trust me, I'm going to cut this out of my shorter talk, but I, did, I, I love diversity, so I had to do that. What do we have to deal with? 145 birds, 19,000, I said 15,000, 19,000, 38% breed locally, 28% year-long residents, 56% summer, 3 in winter, don't like winters in Montana too much, 13% migrants, they're going to play a big role in March and April data. And then we looked at it a whole different way, trophic classes, and we say that if we look at species, oh, at least, at least my thing works though. If we look at it just from species, we see that omnivores and invertebrates are co-dominant. But if we look at it in numbers, we see that omnivores are dominant and invertebrates are subdominant. So what is a subarea? I wish I could avoid this, but unfortunately we have to just get a little bit more back in radiation. You can look at a subarea as five miles of stream consisting of five reaches, each about a mile long. Okay? And a lot of our data is organized by subarea. But you could also say it's a unique set of habitats in a particular setting so that subarea 2 is not a replicate of subarea 1. It's a different set of habitats and it's in a different setting. So when, you, when I show you data and I say this is subarea 1 and subarea 2, they're really like two independent samples, okay? Now, how many people here have worked with similarity indices? Paul, I'm sure, who, who's worked with similarity indices? So Robert, their education is remiss, I think. We have to, yes. Okay, okay, well, here's, here's how it works for this one. This is Sorensen. So if, let's take species one, okay? And let's say in one community, or not, we're gonna do it in one year. One year there's 30, and the next year there's 15, all right? The C here is in common, so they have 15 in common, times two is 30. Everybody with me? So that we got 30 in the numerator. And down here we have the two different values, 15 and 30, so it's 45. So you have 30 over 45, that's two thirds, 67%. Okay? I know that's fast, but it's a way of comparing things. Okay? We can compare communities or years. And this is a similarity matrix. Pregnant with meaning. It really is. This is very useful. I don't see them used that often, but they are. So. <clears throat> If we look at that diagonal of 100s, well, that's because that's 2005 compared to 2005 and 2006 compared to 2006. Okay, so that's unity. Now, the expectation would be that this diagonal would be the next highest. But you know what? That looks like it's just about the same as the mean, around 66%. And the expectation would be that the lower left corner, because, see, that would be 2017 and 2005, that should be the lowest, because they're the farthest away in time. Okay, and then what about this, the 86 and the 82? Well, there's no particular explanation for that. So I'm gonna get ahead of a game. So what is this pregnant meaning I'm talking about? Temporal relations are weak. That's what that tells you, temporal relations are weak. If temporal relations were strong, 2005 versus 2006 would be the most similar because they're only a year apart. But look, the mean's 66 and that's 66. So. All our expectations should be tempered that there's going to be weak temporal relations. And this is subarea 2, another sample, and we see really very similar thing to that. Uh, that's close to the mean, an aberrant high value. In this case, the lower left is the highest, but it's only just a little bit, or the lowest, I'm sorry. It's only just a little bit lower than the other ones. So that's our first lesson. The similarities are rather low, you don't know that, but I'm just telling you they're rather low, 60%, 70%, that's kind of low. And it foretells weak temporal relations. Now, since this is science, we have to ask the question, is this sampling going to answer our question? Okay, now anybody can take uh, some, some flattering slides of their project and attach an narrative to it, and hooray, you know, it's self-aggrandizing. Right? But we have to look at this and say, can this sampling answer the questions of can we, get, can we detect temporal trends where they exist? So we're going to look at, and every time I change graph, and I know they're out of different numbers, they're from different reports, <coughs> it's species richness, and this is, we're going to sample <coughs> not once a month, but twice a month, a week apart. Maybe we should have been a day apart. I could accept maybe we should have done that, but we did them a week apart. <coughs> and here's what we see. We see in March and April that there's more birds the second time. More species, I'm sorry. 
Well, that per makes perfect sense because that's when the migratory birds are coming in, so that, that doesn't surprise me. And here, it's lower, and I have no reason to say that that should be, so I'm going to say that's sampling error, okay? So that's, that's definitely an error factor there coming in. That was richness. Now we're going to look at mean species. I like this measurement more, and it shows a little bit different story. I should, I should tell you, though, that as different as these are, if you combine them into the year, okay, no more months, their difference is only 1%. So that's a central limits theorem working in our favor. You're with me? So, so there's going to be variation in months that comes closer together as we look at it for the year. Okay, now we have mean species, and we see the exact same thing here. This is more what I would expect. So um, we're seeing a difference here that is explainable, and those are, are pretty close. Now we're going to look at birds or counts instead of species. And we have one is up. This is just like what we were talking about with the, ring, with the gulls today. They come in. Snow geese was another one one time. They come in. They leave. These two are a little more together. And now we're going to look at equitability. Remember that? That's that Shannon bell I told you it has, the, it has a lug function and a um, relative abundance in it. And still, we see that in the first month it's up in the second. In, in May and June, it's pretty close. I thought I had one more, but I guess that's it. So, <clears throat> if we're going to look at months, we expect to see something in excess of 20% of the mean in March or 15% in April for us to think that it might be significant, okay, to, to attribute anything to it. <coughs> but less in, in May and June. But when you pull the months, there's almost always no difference. And so some of our data is by month and some of it's by year. So we can put more weight into those years of data, okay. Now we're going to look at trends in bird quantity. So this, I use different words, but bird census or whatever. Let's see, here's what I see. I see no trend. I see no trend. I'm sorry, we just said we had to have 15% right before we thought we saw it in end. Yeah, I don't think so. I see no trend. I see no trend. All right, now, I'm sorry, I should have showed you this. Each one of those bars is a different year, okay? Each bar is a different year. That's telling you that the birds come on so quick after construction, after remediation, and they don't increase much even 10 years later, whatever we have here, 12 years, okay? That's kind of surprising. I think most people would have expected some kind of, whoop, go this way for you, some kind of gradual increase building up. Didn't happen. They come back pretty, pretty quick. And this is sub area two, so remember that's just another one. And this is even better. No trend, no trend, no trend, no trend. Okay, so there's less than two. If you build it, the birds come quickly, and not many more come later. Now, thanks to MR for this photo. Speaking about birds and water, if you have water, you get birds. They wish they did, and everybody knows that's a Berkeley pit, right? And, and so if you have water, so that's going to be part of our dynamic. Remember, the four species, one was a duck, one was a goose, and one of them was a gull that likes to spend time around water, okay? And here's that scope he was looking through now. It's a, it's a rafting, small waterfowl with a white beak. It's a coot. It's a coot. So those are coots on the Berkeley pit there. Now we're going to switch topic from counts of birds and look at species richness and equitability. Now let's see what we get. Sub area one. Ah, no trend. Wait a minute. That looks like a trend. That looks like a trend. And even here you have to say, okay, the first two years are low and, and the last three years are higher. So now we're starting to see a trend in species. Species density and eh, not, so, not so much, but that's our, certain, we're certainly seeing it in May and June, okay? Species density, and I think we're seeing general trend. And we already knew from the similarity matrix that we're not going to see really super strong trends. And sub area one, species equitability, increasing, 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 increasing. So, oh, I guess I had one more. But they're all showing pretty much the same thing, increasing, certainly compared to low years. That's beautiful, and that's pretty dang nice, too. So our, our next lesson, which I think we're up to three, but I labeled this, too, so maybe I have to go back and change that, is bird diversity increases over time, especially in May and June, less reliably in March and April. But I'm not saying it didn't increase in March and April, but it wasn't as pretty. 
as May and June. Now we're looking at a whole new way, trophic structure, what they eat. Not looking at species richness, equitability, not looking at bird counts. And <clears throat> I had great hopes for this, I really did. I, this, here's an innovative way. So Nate is smiling here at my chagrin, I guess. Here's what I see. No trend, no trend, no trend, <laughs> no trend. Okay, so that failed to elucidate the pattern any better um, by looking at it in a different way. And now we're looking at Sudbury 2, same thing. Uh, this is a little higher, and this is something had to compensate. This is a little lower. I'm still going to say overall, there's no trend. Okay, I don't think there's any trend in trophy cues. So now we're going to turn to habitats and habitat heterogeneity. Now remember, I told you each sub area is a unique set of habitats. All right, <clears throat> what we have here is 20 stations, so that means it's a sub area, it's sub area one, and I pulled the data for the two latest years, 2013 and 2017, and this is the number of birds counted at each station, all right? And we see they're anything but equal. So right here, this starts up by the interstate bridge. Bridge means cliff swallow. So that's going to be strongly influenced by cliff swallows. And to some extent, the next couple stations, you know, if they happen to be out there. And then things kind of equilibrate. And there's a couple places that are actually pretty low here. Equilibrate. And then, holy cow, what happened? Got an 11 acre wetland. 11 acre wetland. And it had a little influence coming, getting closer to it. So, that wet, so we have structure and wetland, great boost. And then at the end, there's another wetland that's just north of our area. Um, so it didn't quite come down to the, to the level there. Now, a question for you, is that graph visually suck? Is that better? Which of those do you like? You like the black and white one? Okay, thank you. And I'll, I'll get rid of that other one. I have so much trust. Used to be able to do this, more things I think in PowerPoint or maybe. And when it brings them in Excel, it's just like, we're going to change everything. Uh, you're never going to see those colors you picked before. That was nice that you did, but no, they're gone now. So that's what you get. <clears throat> All right, where are we? Okay, so we said that there's great differences of use among the stations, so there's a lot of habitat difference. And now, now we're looking at equitability, which is absolutely great thing to apply here. And we're seeing that that's really pretty constant. So that's saying, okay, those habitats may differ a lot, but the yearly pattern is about the same every year. So that's kind of nice. That's, the, you know, those, those same stations. It doesn't tell you the same station, but it tells you some station is going to have those, those kind of uh, high numbers uh, among all the lower numbers. So lesson four, there's a huge habitat differential within sub-areas, but the population pattern is, uh, pattern is pretty consistent over time. So special habitats. Now, Robert, do you have some students in here? Yes. Who can we pick on? Um. <laughs> Somebody that got their head down, I hope. Some... The guy in the red shirt. How many habitats do you think there are on Silver Bowl Creek? I don't know, five or six. Okay, I'm gonna give you a clue, it's not a number. The answer isn't a number. How many bird habitats? I should have said, how many bird habitats? You haven't talked about this, huh? All right, we, that's enough humiliation for a while here. Okay, the answer is as many as the birds tell you. As many as the birds tell you. If more birds come, they will discern more habitats. I'm going to give you an example of that if I can keep, keep in mind. But I think that you're going to, when I show you this, when I show you a picture of this, I think you're going to have to say, yeah, Rich, I'm not going to argue with you. Fluvial tall shrubs does seem to look like a habitat. Now, if you were a loggerhead shrike, you might say, oh, well, that's very nice, but what I like is a buffalo berry because I like to impale my prayer, prey on those spines. So that's really not what I'm looking for. See what I'm getting at? Okay, so this is just to have an ecological, you know, teaching moment to try to understand that. But this, so this is going to be one of the types that we look at, fluvial types. That's 10 years old. Now, they're planted like this. I'm not one to spend fortunes on big, so they're planted like this. They died like flies. We had some sodic soil in there. And yet, 10 years later, that's how it looked. And here's some closer to town. This is right by Rocker. That's 12-year-old. So that's the type we're looking at. 
So, let's see if you can guess, but I showed you already. What's the trend in counts going to be over time? This, this is the number one habitat that we sample. It should be exactly the same as the histogram showed, no trend, right? And it'd be a shocking if we found out that it had a trend being our number one habitat and the other, so that's doing the same thing. Looking at numbers, but what if we look at species? Well, we find exactly what we saw before. We have a trend. It's a modest trend. It doesn't have a correlation curve, uh, what do you call it, correlation of uh, determination of 80 or something like that, but we see a trend in species. So that's nice. We looked at things two separate ways and we see that we have an increase in, in uh, species. So, the problem with counting, remember how we started this with the, my, my buddy saying this, the basic statistics is counting? The trouble with counting is that everything's reduced to mere numbers, right? And so we can have species coming and going and all we're looking at is the net change, if there's a net change. Are you with me on this? Some, some can be coming, some can be leaving. We're not detecting that. We're just looking at the numbers. And the numbers look like they're pretty consistent. Okay? So I hope you could just you take a second and read that. Do your counting at the same time each year, right? Yeah. Yep. And, and it's, the, it's, the, it's the last, last week, a day within the last week of each of those months, every time. But what I'm trying to get at here is that we're just treating them as numbers. Okay, that's, that's how we're looking at them. And we see only the net effects. So when we say there's no difference, no difference in counts, that doesn't mean there's no difference in this species or that species, right? So now we're going to look at three habitats specialists. Number one is the willow. Hey, this is the wiffle, remember? I told you there was a reason you wanted to know what the wiffle was. It's the willow flycatcher. And there's the willow flycatcher, and guess what? Those are willows, okay? So the willow flycatcher, it's an insect eater. It's an aerial forager. I love this phrase, and it darts out from elevated perches to grab these insects. <coughs> now, just for fun, the southwestern subspecies, so it's actually the same species, is endangered. Why would that be? Now, for the same reason down where I live in Dillon, there's hardly any willows left compared to what there used to be. The cow. The cow. So the cow comes and it trashes the stream itself, but mainly because they want to make hay fields, so they eradicate all the willows for that, and then they want to divert the water out of the stream. So, you know, the number of riparian shrubs is just a tiny fraction. Couldn't possibly be 5% down in southwest Montana than from what it used to be. Even on a forest service. Did you know up at... Um, What's at the top of the hill here? You go over behind Our Lady. Delma Lake is the, the big wetland, though. <coughs> Up in the, us over in this Deer, purse. Deer Park, too? Huh? Deer Park? I don't think it's Deer Park, but uh, you, 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 you the, no, okay, but go from Elk Park and then go back over the ridge. Whitetail. 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 Exactly. It's Whitetail. Did you know the Forest Service sprayed those willows to kill them to get the extra mouthful of grass for their cows? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so even the areas that aren't down low, like I'm talking about, have been destroyed. All right, we're going to look at these now. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I had to use classes because the reaches in the sub-area have different ages, okay, because the reach is done at a time. So <clears throat> look at this. This is pretty impressive. Sub-area 1, 2, 14, 18. 2, 9, 12. So in this case, we see vegetational development, the willows growing. Got to remember, this wasn't even a tall, it, it wasn't a tall fluvial shrub. It was a meadow because the willows are only this big, right? But they grow up. So that's, that's a, an, an interesting development for that species. And here's an example at, uh, right at Silver Bow. The first willow flag catcher was seen seven years after the first little willows were planted. So that's about how long it takes for that habitat to be recognized by the willow flycatcher. We're going to look at another one. This is the second most abundant habitat. Wetlands, another word you hear associated with is palustrine. And those are emergent plants. I'm not going to go into it, but they're plants that grow up. But, but cattails, it seems to be pretty big for, for this. And there's a good example. That's in Reach F. That's by Silver Bowl. That's a beautiful uh, the bird book would call it a swamp, but let's, let's call it a marsh. It sounds a little more accurate there. Let's look at the bird count in wetland. What do you expect? Nothing. 
We always expect nothing from bird counts. Right? Now it's true that there's a little bit of a slope. I got to tell you, one of the weaknesses of regression analysis, it puts a lot of weight on that last point, even if just one sample. Sorry, that's how it works. So <clears throat> if, look, think of it this way. Cut that off. I think that graph would look pretty much like this. Right? Look at that. Look at that. A lot of noise in that. We look at species instead of counts, and we get the same thing. We get a modest trend of increasing species over time. So now we're going to look at the mawer. Remember the mawer, the marsh wren? Okay. It's another insectivore, it's a summer visitor, and you can read that sentence which sums it up pretty good. And there's a picture of the mawer. It looks exactly like the willow flycatcher. No, I just said that to torque off my buddy here. <laughs> and sure enough, his eyes were rolling right as I said it. But it doesn't look exactly like it. <laughs> okay. So, sub area four was done. So the first, this is the first year that it was done. That's and here's what we got. This should be sub area two. Here. I had sub area two. I thought I changed it. That's, that's wrong, huh? Yeah. Okay. It should be sub area two. Okay. It was sub area two. I changed it this morning. Okay, and in 2014 we had zero, zero, zero in the three months, right? And there's more in the later months. And in 2016 we had three, seven, and ten. So this is another one that's benefited from vegetational develop. And there's another picture of that kind of vegetation. That's at uh, Nistler Wetland. There, where kind of where I-15 goes over. Now some species prefer more open habitats, and that would be the SPSA, the spotted sandpiper. It's a summer shortbird that feeds on invertebrates. And there's a picture. And uh, indeed, there's the spots, but I gather they're only there, what, in summer or winter, one or the other, the spots? Yeah, in, the, in the fall, they just bear. What's that? Just a bare breast in the fall. Bare breast in the fall, but right now you can see why it's called the spotted sandbar. All right. <clears throat> this was laid bare by the flood in 2011. Trust me, we don't, we don't build it this way with lots of rocks and stuff. Everything was eroded away. And <clears throat> right now, I could expect to see a spotted sandpiper there. No problem. Looks like good habitat to me. But I hope you can see that this is going to end up pretty vegetated. So, so right now, it looks like really good habitat for it. There's, you can't even tell where our original banks or the stream were. It's, everything's washed away here. And here's another one after the flood, and this is fresh sediment that was laid down. And you know, this one had some sediment too that was laid down out there. <clears throat> and those are willows. Those are baby willows. And they weren't planted. They, that, so never underestimate the natural recovery process. Someone other than me, if they'd been influencing this project, they would bring back in fresh cover soil, Order a bunch more willows when we get to transplanters. Never underestimate the recovery process. A flood just does something to rejuvenate the heck out of any fluvial system. So, <clears throat> sub area four has lots of ponds, and in June, this is a sub area four one, huh? Okay. So, this is going to be the most bare state as soon as it's done, and this is going to be two years later. So, we're seeing a declining trend as the vegetation fills in around the pond margins along any gravel bars along the creek and so on. But this is even better, I think. This is sub area one and we see from two thousand whoops. We see from two thousand five seventeen, thirteen, four, 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 that looks like equilibrium to me. I don't think there's any equilibrium along streams, but it sure looks like there is one here. What's interesting is that we had a flood here and a flood here and it's still Looks like it's pretty constant. And now we look Are at... The species the same in each category each this, year? This is all spotted sandpiper numbers. Oh, okay. Okay, okay and then we're going to look at sub-area 2. And we see a similar trend. Oh, it's not quite as pretty. Okay, sub-area 2 has a lot of ponds and pretty flat. So tiny changes in water elevation can either expose or cover what I'm going to call mud flats. Okay, so so there's going to be a lot lot more noise in that than in sub area one because of the ponds and the the shallow. So what do we say about the spotted sandpiper? Well, it's an early cereal habitat, right? And vegetational development works against it, and floods and disturbances work for it. 
So, summing up, birds instantly colonized fresh habitat with no discernible increase in the following decade. That was our first thing. Bird species composition, this is the similarity indices, is rather dissimilar among even consecutive years, so trim temporal trends are going to be weak. Species richness, species density, anything to do with species, has a modest in modestly increasing trend over the ensuing 15 years. And as habitat, habitats change through vegetational development or disturbance, bird habitat specialists wax or wane. And so we end a little wiser, I hope. I have to give all the credit in the world to the Natural Research Damage Program. They funded this for 2005, what, a dozen years, a dozen years. And uh, so they, they deserve the credit. They also bought all the water pipes in Butte and water treatment plant, but they did this too. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that was the last slide. Yeah. <laughs>